Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for uh, making time for this session. Uh, as you can say, uh, as you can see, agility in complex transformation programs and oxymoron is is the title of my session. A little bit about uh, myself. My name is Yashasri Barve. I'm working as an enterprise agile coach and a transformation consultant at TCS. Been with Tata's all through my career. It's going to complete 25 years in July in in the IT industry. And uh, I'm an author of this book that uh, the image that you see here, Agile Mindset, which is available on Amazon. I'm a blogger. I blog at my personal website, and um, I'm an avid reader. I'm a speaker at conferences, and I'm also a volunteer uh, for uh, TCS's Purpose for Life. And we have a we have an initiative which is called as Youth Employment Program. So it's um, it, it's a lot of pleasure to talk to people who are like the youth who are from uh, underprivileged background to prepare them to come into corporate. So that's about me. And uh, my agile journey actually started in around 2007. And I had been working as a technical architect then. And I just got fascinated by, you know, the way we had been. Uh, do you need some time? Shall I? OK. So uh, I just got fascinated by the way we were collaborating with teams, working with business to churn out something which was working software, right? Like rather than having a project manager. And it was very, I didn't even know when I switched my role from a technical architect to an agile coach. And it's been a great journey since then, working with various product teams, helping them as an the scrum master, as an agile coach to evolve their way of working, helping them in transforming and also delivering working software. So when I started, uh, mostly I had been working on products like uh, one or more teams. You know, that's how I started. And um, the, the way things were looked something like this, right? So this is like the road construction in the local neighborhood. So there are limited number of stakeholders, limited number of people who are going to get impacted, maybe thousands, you know, if this is somewhere in Mumbai, even a local neighborhood road would be like thousands of people will be affected, but it will normally be a single authority, single administration, right, who will be involved in construction of a road in a local uh, lane kind of a thing. In the recent years, the work that I have been doing, which is on large programs, actually started something like this. You know, it started looking something like this, which is like a mega highway that gets constructed and that is connecting multiple states the complexity levels are way different, right? Normally to construct a mega highway across multiple states, it would mean that we have to have many, many multiple things getting involved. Multiple state authorities, state governments, different political parties, there will be legalities involved because you know, land acquisition has to come in place, forest department, n number of uh, um, resistances that will you know, come, from, uh, come from the locals, or rather, if it is the Mumbai Mumbai Nagpur uh, Samruddhi Highway, which is there, we would also have to take care of animals. Like there is an underpass that had to be created so that elephants could cross. So the the kind of complexities that happen in such a program is enormous as against you know simple road construction that happens in uh, in a in a small city or a small town, right? Well, of course, I'm not involved in this domain. I am still talking from a software domain, but yes, the complexities of having those multi things are still very, very valid in that case. So coming back to software domain, I thought, let's just set some context with respect to what do we mean by a transformation program? So this uh, definition is coming from PMI. It's coming from a paper that was presented at a PMI conference. And it talks about how um, the transformation change, the, the way people processes technology, physical infrastructure, etc change to cover the uh, new capabilities that have to be developed for organizations to achieve whatever are their new outcomes, right? Like for example, the mega highway that we spoke about, it actually helps people to commute in much, much lesser time that, than they would have already taken, you know, to, to uh, commute across multiple states. Or it might, it might just explore the opportunities for trade, you know, we might have many more opportunities, many more uh, potential opportunities for people to travel 
and you know look for new jobs and things like that so lot of new opportunities open up whenever we undertake such transformation programs they also are driven by a sense of urgency that we want to complete it in one year two year whatever you know multi years that we are looking at and they are very very broad in terms of their scope as well as in terms of their impact so typically any of such transformation programs will be when we talk about transformation programs i know that um, many of you would have noticed that the the number of transformation programs have really picked up during covid and post covid though of course we had a lot of digitization and digital transformation programs that were already happening but a transformation program could be anything it could be an enterprise transformation let's say there are mergers and acquisitions so you know there are some uh, enterprise level transformations that have to happen or those could be technology transformations like sasification or moving to cloud you know those kind of um, transformation programs can happen it could be change in the structure of the organization so the organization wants to transform to new way of working or new new operating structures and so on so there could be many such things and however one thing that is common across all of these uh, transformation programs is the complexity right the the scope you know the the way so many things are touched and so many lives of people are touched that is what is probably common across these let's also look at what do we mean by agility Now, this one i have picked up from merriam uh, webster dictionary so the so agility is basically the quality or the state of being agile right or nimbleness Now, how quickly are we able to do something whereas agile will mean ready ability marked by ready ability ready ability something where we are ready we are able we are ready to move with quick and easy grace so it is not that we are able to move quickly but we are kind of you know leaving a lot of chaos behind right like not like monkeys right whenever they are agile but um, the way they uh, create nuisance that's not what we are talking about we are talking about something which is um quick easy gracefully done right so that's what we are talking about uh, being agile so when we put these two things in the context like agility which is being able to really move quickly being able to respond to changes quickly and the large transformation uh, complex transformation programs it really doesn't really go very well together right and it that's where i started thinking about you know whether it is really like an oxymoron right are we really able to none of the transformation programs say that we are not agile right nowadays it's like a it's a crime and people don't look at you with the same uh, uh, same perception if you say we are not agile right everybody wants to say that they are agile and everybody wants to label their transformations whatever digital you know business transformation technology transformation as being agile you know like for example i am working on a sap transformation project and yes we are using agile ways of working but where is the agility and that's where i started thinking about uh, how is agility in the context of large uh, transformation programs so uh, just a quick show of hands like how many of you are part of transformation programs everybody excellent great okay all right so um just moving to this there was something that really triggered my thought and you know this was this video is uh, you know this person anybody do you know this person this is andy hunt um one of the co-authors of the agile manifesto and the author of the series of pragmatic books pragmatic programmer and so on we had an amazing talk by andy last year and it was about uh, the legacy like legacy in you and uh, one thing that really struck me you know what he spoke about last year was about how do you like he was talking about how people are talking about you know how do you do stories how do you um, churn out working software etc uh, do you do the scrum events well etc etc so he was like he literally said that you know all that crap may not be agile but there is something that very very simple test to see whether we are being agile or not right so i just wanted to play that quick video i hope i'll get the sound so here's the test you know am i agile enough suppose there's a big change in how you understand the user requirements There's a big shift in technology, a big shift in the market. Can you quickly and easily adapt to that change, or not? Can you cause that change on purpose and then adapt to it so you have a competitive advantage? That's what agile is all about. Um, it. Yeah. Do you agree? To what he said. 
yeah so we are talking about like andy what 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 andy speaks about is that if there is a change that happens in the technology or in the requirements how easily are we able to adapt to it also if let's say that change has not happened are we able to make that change bring that change and see how easily we are able to adapt to it if we are then yes then we are agile otherwise you know we may be doing all sorts of scrum events we may be doing um, all ceremonies we may have the right roles but we may still not be we still may not be agile so sorry about that so so going from there like keeping the context of the transformation programs the agile and what we heard from andy um if we look at the industry data on the way the large programs have happened the data is pretty bad the data says like if you look at any of the analysts like mckinsey's or the bwc's and gartners of the world what we see is maximum of the programs that we had like a lot of large programs that we had 25 to 40% of them exceeded their budgets they had schedule overruns right and well i have been seeing that also like when we are working with our customers a lot of large programs are facing these kind of problems right and even more than 50% of the schedules uh, you know are being overrun and a tiny tiny portion of 2.5% completing 100% of their projects on time or if you see 60% of the data projects failed was a prediction but they really found like 80 85% of the big data projects transformation projects failing right so this is a really really bad data which says that majority of the transformation programs are failing and they are not able to actually um adapt to whatever changes are being brought in, in by the market or technology changes or whatever are the changes right so um this is really stuff definitely something that makes one feel that uh, are we really being being agile in any of these programs so as so many of you have also been working in in large transformation programs as you raised your hands can i request all of you to please uh, give your inputs on this menti menti survey quickly so the question is which barriers have you seen to agility in large complex transformation programs right you can go to menti.com and the code is 56400382 so put in some um, it's not readable i'm sorry about that from here but i've put in some of the barriers that i have seen in uh, large complex transformation programs would love to see what are the things that you have seen in your programs multi vendor scenarios centralized decision making big long releases big bang releases too many dependencies conflicts great decision making seems to be along with dependencies uh huh need more time thank you thank you for that resembles very well with what i have in my presentation i'm happy that you are also looking at the same barriers that even i have been uh, looking at so i want to take opportunity to talk about three three things that really really have um, impeded agility in the programs that i have worked with first is the dependencies for any large programs and we heard this uh, in the morning right about dependencies that dependencies are going to be there and we have to minimize dependencies as much as we can but they are unavoid unavoidable we heard it from fred I'm so happy to see that dependencies there uh, the second is about scope and it it is just never ending scope you know never ending changes in the requirements it just doesn't stop and it just um, blows all the release planning that we have done right that is the second thing and the third thing is about team dynamics so i saw a lot of you feel that uh, multi vendor creates a challenge and it, actually there are just too many people too many departments too many teams involved and that actually impedes the agility a lot so um so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to talk about the problems that are faced uh, in these three areas and some of the things that have worked 
I don't think there is a clear cut answer as to these are the one, two, three things that we need to do and you know then we will be able to get rid of the dependencies or things like that. If, it, if, if there was some then we wouldn't see the data that we saw. But I just wanted to share you know what has worked and I will also share what has not worked you know for any of these, right? Any uh, reactions, any comments so far? Yes. Yeah, no, we are not talking about agile transformation programs. We are talking about business transformation, technology transformation, enterprise, any transformation program, not necessarily agile. It could also be related to agile. If you know, like for example, you started with something, you planned for you know some maybe some a couple of departments, and uh, you said that yeah maybe this is our journey and this is how this is where we want to be, and then in one of the reviews you you keep getting. Oh, but what about DevOps? You know, when are you going to start with the DevOps uh, side of it? Or it could even be related to that. But my focus majorly is on uh, business transformation, technology transformation programs. Yeah, agility in those programs, basically. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Like I, I completely agree. And uh, to give you some examples, like any uh, any transformation that would happen in an enterprise. So just to take an example of the one that I have been involved in, uh, an SAP transformation. There are legacy systems in the enterprise which nobody wants to touch. Nobody wants to make any changes to that. However, we still want, like they still use the data, right? So the data is still the same, like enterprise, the whole uh, database is the same. So data structure, uh, the way data is stored is going to change once we move to some products, right? Which are not, cust which are probably not customized. Then what does it mean? And it really impedes. And um, we talk about, also giving some examples, like we talk about, we, we tried a lot of things to, you know, bring in agility in the way even the SAP things work, right? So we would say, yeah, at least in these three weeks or four weeks, we will do this or five weeks, we will at least complete this. Legal systems, they don't even want to promise, right? Because they really don't know how much time it may take. Yes, so I agree with that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, right. So even the team structure, like the way you may want to structure the teams in certain way, but you simply can't because of the monolithic. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that. Yes. Absolutely, yeah, oh, I completely agree. And a lot of team dynamics also happen because of the dependencies, right? Like, for example, this uh, legacy thing that we were just talking about. So, so this transformation, whichever team is actually doing the, uh, let's say, taking things to cloud is dependent on the legacy uh, system because they are not able to uh, do it. So there is a lot of dynamics that happens, like, like people start blame games and that further impedes the whole progress that we want to make. Yeah, so I agree, yeah. Okay, all right. Anything else? Okay. okay, so let's start. So I, I really wanted to, uh, like whenever I, I thought about, you know, how to represent dependencies, you know, I, I could think of a metaphor of a dungeon, right? So once we are lost in, in a dark dungeon, you really can't figure out where to go and you just keep uh, uh, finding your way out and you find that more and more deep dungeons and, you know, our way is completely lost. Dependencies sometimes feel like that, right? So you try to resolve one and then you discover there are more and you try to complete one and then newer ones uh, come up and we simply start uh, you know feeling like we are lost completely so here are some of the things that i heard and these are 
things that real people said on the transformations, right? So we can't really do anything before they complete it. So there is a story, but however, they are not able to do anything before somebody else completes something. Or um, we cannot even start working on it till the interface is not finalized. So I had this one um, point uh, where there was a um, interfacing system that was supposed to do some changes. They said that we cannot even start till you don't even complete the interface. You know, we can only start. So in spite of having a five-week sprint, the first two weeks, a particular story could not start because they said we cannot start till the interface is finalized at all. Or design gets stuck or the, the number of dependencies sometimes is so huge that you know there are um, 300 plus downstream applications that take this data, right? Whenever there is any core system getting transformed in an enterprise, there are so many systems that are dependent on, you know, with respect to data and so on. So a lot of these, you know, things keep happening. I just want to take a quick case study of a program that I was involved in. So 200 plus people, 300 plus upstream and downstream systems that are uh, you know, impacted because of the changes that we are doing. It was taking something from on-prem to cloud. And uh, the, the problem is that it was not simply just moving something to the cloud, like the uh, on-prem application to the cloud, but it, the, the enterprise also thought about taking an advantage and doing also a business process transformation because of that. So because of that business process thing, 10 plus departments, which is like one department is IT and nine departments are non-IT departments that are getting uh, uh, involved in the decision making, right? So with this case study uh, in mind, I'll, I'll just, I would like to share what worked for us. So the first and the most important thing which we feel helped, though did not completely, uh, you know, resolve the dependencies is the way we managed our rate items, right? So rate is... Uh, I'm sure you would have heard, but risks, assumptions, issues or impediments and dependencies. So it is extremely critical for any transformation program or any large program for that matter to make sure that we are managing the risks, assumptions, issues and dependencies very, very well. And when we say we are managing, it means that it will start with identification. That is the first step of course, you know, what are the risks, identifying what are the risks, then uh, trying to log it into your um, whatever is your tracking tool that you're using, Azure DevOps, Jira, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, Excel, whatever it is, log it and then continuously track it. So it is extremely important to have it made transparent, right? So, um, so we normally use RAID dashboards for all the various teams that we have and every team is using the RAID dashboard on a daily basis. So we kind of try to make it transparent and also inspect and adapt. Uh, the kind of frequency that we have been using is for every team, we do it daily. So every day we look at what are the dependencies that we have and uh, how are we placed, how are we going to uh, make progress on those dependencies. And at a multiple teams level, it is twice a week. So every team does it daily and all the teams come together and look at dependencies on each other uh, on a twice a week kind of a fashion. Dependency maps, uh, again another thing that we found it useful. So we used Jira. So the dependency maps created in Jira really helped us to actually look at, you know, where things are stuck and so on. And raising early flags. So we kind of used the concept of blockers. So started flagging things as blockers is if the dependency is soon going to turn into risks, then we started flagging those as blockers and that has really helped us. Anything uh, on risks or rate management, dependency management, anybody wanted to share? Any, anything else that has worked for you? Yes. Yeah. So, okay, so to understand your question better, so there is a strategic risk yeah. and then that has caused some risks at the team level. So how do we, how do we track it? So normally we have been tracking uh, team level risks on a daily basis in, in the daily uh, connects that we have, daily huddles and strategy risks are revisited twice a week in the cross team huddle. And of course there are separate meetings that happen for the leadership teams and they handle, you know, the um, strategy risks, they also discuss the dependencies and strategic risks there, yes. Yeah, is it a separate meetings uh, or it is uh, same meeting you are discussing with the RAID uh, or risk register or something like that? 
So, yeah, so we do not use risk register, but of course, I mean any of the ways you we can uh, use it, but we use Jira dashboards basically for RAID. So, in the same daily hurdle that we have to track our, uh, synchronize our daily progress within a team, we also discuss the rates. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, the second most important thing that also has a lot of dependencies and what we what we observed is the decision making delays. Yes. So that's fine, I'll just please. So the way uh, I typically tell the team is, uh, RAID stands for as we know, the risk as assumptions. So issues and dependencies are something that we'll have to manage. But I try to at least minimize assumptions. Mm -hmm. So at least one is knocked off. The faster we move the assumption to either a dependency or a risk. Absolutely. Uh, a dependency naturally will turn, see it, it's a cyclic process like yeah. you can't just eliminate something out of it yeah so if you're making an assumption which typically means to say i will assume that this technology would be finalized i don't want to do that i put that as a dependency on the technology stack team the who's deciding team. it or the CTO, yeah. Yeah. cto office who's making that thing and get to an end date to say it's a dependency on you i'll track it as a dependency i'm not making i'm i'm not make, make it very clear that i'm not assuming anything i'll yeah. ask yeah so that way the assumption typically is more or less in a very small number and I try to move it into a dependency quickly Absolutely. or to a risk uh, so that uh, if you make, you know, uh, we all know, assume word is, yeah, yeah, if yeah. you don't want to create a, yeah. create, a, create a problem there. Yes. That's Absolutely. one way to manage it. Yeah. yeah, thank you, thank you for sharing. And yes. Uh, I think just extending his point, even in my experience, we have stopped using A there and mm. what I've been using is CRED, again not referring to the CRED app or something, but C stands for constraint. Uh -huh. So constraints are important to call out by the teams or even at a portfolio level to, so to really call out that what is the constraint for me to deliver upfront so that we can work on it. So A is no longer sort of use because assumptions we will have to deal with it. Constraints are really critical in that way. Yeah, absolutely. A yeah, great input, I think. Perfect. And uh, we also have kind of laid out a model in which uh, we educate, we have educated teams to ensure that, you know, if there are uh, risks that are really like aging risks that are not getting resolved at all, converting it into issues. Similarly, dependencies can become risks and risks can become issues. So, you know, even that kind of a, a education is, that kind of a model is set, I would say, you know, and uh, that helps. Because at least whether we are able to solve it or not, even after raising it as a blocker with the leadership is a separate thing, but at least the teams have done uh, everything that they can, right? That's that's the commitment that we normally have from our teams. Okay, all right. So um, another place where there has been a lot of dependency and uh, you know a lot of delays that have got introduced is in the process of decision making. As we uh, saw in in the example, and typically the case, there are so many different departments that are uh, involved, and uh, a lot of times we have seen that there are too many people who are involved in you know making decisions, and the decisions just don't happen. Right, the decisions are pending there, and the due dates change, and you know that really, really impedes uh, you know the 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 delivery that uh, we have to make. So we actually had very nice uh, retrospective discussions on that, and we figured out that uh, major reason behind this is uh, the FOMO syndrome, right? The fear of missing out. What happens if I'm not a part of that discussion, right? What what if some decision is happening without my knowledge, and so on? Uh, it's not easy to tackle FOMO because everybody wants to feel important and it has become more and more critical in today's days when there are so many layoffs and you know people want to ensure that they are considered important in their organizations. But uh, we kind of tried to come up with a working model with the teams and you know the decision makers so that we can really have a small number of people who will take the decisions. It is easier for that meeting to be scheduled and decisions to be taken and everybody else will be kept, kept informed. So uh, this is tough thing, but we have tried as much as and however, still I feel that the whole decision making and the dependencies on decisions has been a major factor in delaying whatever plan we had in mind in, in, in my programs. Yeah. So I also want to uh, share like this is, uh, so you, many of you would have known, uh, would have heard of Ken Rubin, Ken Rubin, uh, the essential scrum author. Um, 
there was one talk that I attended uh, by Ken Rubin in one of the, I think Agile Virtual Summit some time back and it was very, very eye opening and I will highly recommend you to look at, uh, you know, if you are struggling with dependencies in your uh, programs, highly recommend you to look at what he talks about it. He also conducts a separate workshops uh, for teams to actually look at dependencies and understand how, you know, there could be structural or instantiated dependencies and how to, what are the various improvement strategies can, you know, one can get. Even if you do not want to attend the workshop, you can go to Involution or you can just search dependencies are killing your agility, Ken Rubin and you will, uh, you know, find the whole. It, he has, he has so many different improvement strategies uh, suggested. I am sure you know you will find some of the other solutions for your problems there, yeah. All right. So just to sum up uh, what we spoke about dependencies, the rate governance, the risks, assumptions, impediments, dependencies governance, modeling them, mapping, you know, creating maps and tracking them, uh, focusing on decisions, uh, closing decisions on time and team structures. Team structures we did not discuss but it is there in Ken Rubin's uh, things like, like one of the ways to uh, get rid of dependencies is to form team in such a way that it is a multidisciplinary team like what we heard uh, in the morning, right? The team that can actually yes, cross-functional, uh, yeah, cross-functional in the sense where even people who are taking the decisions are also involved, right? So somebody from the data is there, somebody from technology is there and so on, yeah. All right. Um, moving to the next one which is, uh, moving to the next one which is about scope. Uh, scope often is a, is a challenge in um, actually, um, looking at the progress, right? And I have seen this so many places. The silent, I mean, I, I wrote it as silent sabotage. So, well, there is, it's, and it is unintentional in, in my context. I think we, we heard about uh, sabotaging in, in Fred's talk, uh, but in, in, in the context that I am putting this, this is not intentional. It is not that somebody wants to delay the whole program. So they are putting in new things, but a lot of times I have uh, seen that, you know, there are too many missing pieces too many new things that keep discovering that it is very, very difficult to really put together the whole puzzle of what exactly is needed in this transformation program. So, I have heard things like, you know, this is a SAPI, we always do big bang releases. It is not possible. The first one is my husband who says this, right? He is an SAP consultant and he, <laughs> we never talk about Agile at home because, you know, he does not believe in it. <laughs> he talks about SAP and big bang releases, right? So, either it is 1st Jan or 1st July. 1st July date missed, we'll go next 1st Jan and so on. So, it is very, very ingrained in the, in the way he works and you know many of the people work who are working on large products and so on or people just don't know what is expected in a story or in a requirement. So, they say that we don't know, we can't even commit how much time it will take. It, it is very difficult and that happens in transformation programs, right? If it is a small product that we are working on and we are discovering and constantly working with product owners, it may not happen. But when we are talking about multiple stakeholders being involved, multiple stakeholders giving inputs, it is very well uh, possible that it happens. So, I have one more mentee for you, um, just a question, which techniques have helped you to prevent scope being sabotage? So, I have to go to the next slide, just give me a minute. Product ownership, MVP, MVP, reprioritizing, managing expectations, governance, great, thank you. So, I have an example of, uh, of a program which is around 300 plus people involved in the program with 30 plus teams which have multiple stakeholders giving them requirements and there was a 50% schedule over it was a one year program 
which already got delayed by six months. So, which is like a 50 percent overrun, right? And one of the reasons, like some of the reasons that we, we figured out is the lack of strong product ownership. There are multiple stakeholders and there will be multiple stakeholders because it's a large program, right? We will not have only a couple of people, but so many people. But if the team is getting confused and the product owners themselves don't know how to prioritize and what are the right things that the team should take up next and when they should be completed, then, the, then there is a big problem and big risk to the program. So a very, very strong ownership is needed and managing stakeholders, right? The product owner will understand that it is impossible to satisfy or make everybody happy. Right? They have to choose what is it that really, really makes sense for the program to move ahead and accordingly take a call. And it's, it's also critical to do the vertical slicing. Now, it is very easy to do vertical slicing for products, right? Because we can simply go by feature by feature. It becomes more and more complex when we have programs wherein maybe a small size doesn't make sense, right? We had a lot of challenge in convincing people uh, who are working on SAP projects, you know, when they are developing RISE-FW objects as they call it, which is reports, interfaces, convergence, uh, forms uh, and workflows, that they can do a slicing in a way where they can come up with some kind of MVPs, right? And once we could demonstrate one of that can happen, then they themselves could come up with multiple MVPs and we could actually take smaller piece which could be done in a sprint and then you know evolve over it. So it's a very, it's, it's like a very no brainer kind of a thing for any scrum teams or product owners when we are working on pro products, but not so much when we are working on large programs, but I just want to say that it can be done and we have tried it with, uh, with a good percentage of success. And the most important thing is prioritizing and reprioritizing, de-scoping. So we, like the, the previous program that we just spoke about, took a stand and said that, you know, you have to know what is it that you really, really need for day one. What is it that cannot go without, you know, what are the things that cannot uh, wait after day one plus. And doing this ruthless kind of prioritization is extremely critical, otherwise, we will get into the same problem that we had in waterfall world, wherein we want to do everything, so the scope, like the scope has to be finished, so the schedule will go on um, delaying, right? Like the six months program will go to one year and two years and not, it will never get over. It's not easy, but it is extremely critical to do. So asking the right questions, you know, by the product owners has to be really a strong product owner for that. Um, maybe we can take questions. If at all there are any or any thoughts you want to share later, I just want to finish up uh, some of the things that I had. So this was about the scope issues wherein we having strong product ownership, vertical slicing, uh, focusing on MVPs and also maintaining traceability also. We didn't speak about traceability I think, but traceability is about where we have started, like we have started to complete something and of course that has maybe you know you have large requirements and like in SAP parlance we have. BPML, business process master list and breaking it down into L1, L2, L3, L4 and whatever we are working on, how is it related to the business process, right? We have a story or we have a small piece of requirement, how is it helping us to um, have a particular piece of uh, requirement being uh, fulfilled is extremely difficult to, uh, to know. The last one which is about um, team dynamics, right? So the barriers of us versus we versus ours versus, you know, they, them, them, theirs, right? Very, 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 uh, very, very evident. And I, we also saw like some, or most of you agreed about the multi-vendor environment, right? We hear it day in and day out. They only want to increase their headcount, which is in, in case of, you know, if we, there are vendors that have been hired to work on certain things. And if they say that this takes, this is going to take more time or we need more people. This is what we hear. They only want to increase their headcount, that's why they are doing this. Or they do not understand system. Or what were they doing all this while and how can now they come up with some critical requirements, right? They were sleeping all this time, what? All of these things which are putting blame on they, right? And they here could be a different department, a different vendor, a different role, a different team, different region, right? In this region, it's always like that. Or they never know what they really want, you know, that kind of a game. 
A couple of things that have helped, this is a very, very difficult problem to solve, but a couple of things that have helped is alignment to the vision. So over and over talking about what is it that we as a team, like the whole program team, want to accomplish and forget about this is what this vendor wants to do or that department wants to do and so on. Having that vision iterated again and again and getting an alignment to the vision really helped and leadership. So we, I, I have had fortune, I mean fortunate enough to have leaders who speak about, I do not want to hear that this vendor could not complete this or this vendor brought in these challenges. I do not want to hear that. I only want to hear how you can now work so that we are able to fulfill our vision. It's extremely critical. If the leadership gets into, uh, you know, doing five eyes on why this vendor could not do certain things, the program is doomed. Because then everybody simply gets defensive and, you know, no real causes will come out and people will simply try to, you know, just do something for the sake of doing it and for the sake of avoiding penalty and so on, right? The other thing which I, I think is very, very critical and we did this for all the teams is setting up the working model. Who will do what? What are the various roles? Who, whose responsibility is what? You know, making it, laying it down, making it extremely clear, crystal clear by having a discussion within the teams, right? So what is, what is it that our working model is? What are the team norms that we want to set? And the last important thing is change management. And I'm not talking about the change management for the end users. Of course, that is important because, I mean, there has been an instance when uh, a CFO uh, told us that don't worry about the adoption. We will take care of it. They could not take care of it. The whole rollout got postponed by eight, six months, six, six to eight months, I think, because, you know, the people were simply not ready to adopt the new system. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking still about the IT team. Because different people are working with each other, they may be familiar with certain, you know, uh, ways of working. But now we are talking about probably different ways of working when they are working together, right? Or they may be like, uh, just to give you an example, we have a custom application development team which is highly mature in terms of uh, DevOps. And uh, they have a dependent, like they are upstream system for an SAP system. And they, the first time when we meet you, <laughs> they say, you do not have CI/CD. I mean, this is not how we work. Yes, right. But this is SAP. You know, it, we are still you know going to work on it, and we are trying to figure it out. So it is different ways uh, in which people are uh, working, right? Like the SAP team works in a different way. The custom application development team works in a different way. So that management is is a real uh, real challenge that we have to work with. Okay, all right. So yeah. So just I think one last minute. So just to to summarize about the team dynamics, getting everybody aligned to the vision, having leadership support for doing that, extremely critical things before we can even think about having uh, the team dynamics making it better. Defining a working model collaboratively, not like one person defining model and just dictating it to others, but team coming together and defining how they want to work together, very, very important and change management. So we really have to bring in that empathy. Uh, towards, we have to bring in empathy towards others and, you know, educate others to bring in the empathy towards us. And that's probably, you know, the way we can uh, help uh, in terms of improving the team dynamics in a program. Okay. So that brings me to the uh, end. We talked about dependencies, scope. We talked a little bit about team dynamics and a few things that have worked for us uh, in, in certain ways like rate governance, dependency maps, decision making, team structures, strong product ownership, vertical slicing, MVP, prioritizing, traceability, aligning to the vision, change management, leadership support, and defining the working model. So that's what I had and thank you very much. And we can stay connected. Please connect with me on LinkedIn and this is my website name. So uh, thank you very much. I just wanted to mention that some of the images that I have used are from Pixabay and some of them are AI generated images. If you want, you can try this deepai.org just for fun. My son taught me this, but uh, it's, it's fun to have those AI generated images. Thank you very much. Maybe if at all any questions. If any or, questions, please. Yeah. Or any thoughts. Um, I have a question. Um, how do you measure, what does good look like in product ownership? How do you point out that this is not good product ownership? Yeah, well, that's a good question. 
ask the team probably i would like as an agile coach i'll probably ask the team you know what is what is it that they believe in terms of their is the product owner helping them or how are how is the product owner helping them do they understand the requirements clearly right are they able to work on the requirements is the feedback also going back right so um, i mean to to have more scientific answer there are like a few um, questions maybe i can share uh, with you separately that we normally ask in, in terms of the requirements management do you, do we think the decisions are getting delayed because the product owner is not able to work with multiple stakeholders and you know it is not uh, not able to prioritize things uh, or is a product owner coming back and saying uh, everything is high priority and you have to you know get uh, get these things done at all every time those are the kind of things i would uh, look for but uh, i i think that is where i anybody else wants to share anything maybe yeah okay we'll take the last question yeah sure in this larger transformation kind of a project context do you think the contracting type for uh, against uh, with the different vendors would that play a major role in the success it will what also, is your view yes yes yeah i I'm, i'm sure it will play a large role because a lot of times what we have also seen is like we we want to have we want to have the team to come together and you know work together like i'll, I'll give you an example um in in some of the programs that i have worked with a different vendor works on development and a different vendor works on testing and that is because of the compliance requirements right like there are places where we cannot have same vendor doing development and testing in some of the regulatory compliance things they need to have a independent verification some something like that. i don't understand it completely now here there is so much uh, so much uh, tug of war between the development team and the testing team and the testing team is not the unit test unit tests of course are being done by the developers but the final integration or you know the system testing that happens the final verification and validation so it it is very very critical people say that i have had a, an instance where the product vendor said that the contract that we have is only for uh, consulting we will not touch the code we will not do any development we literally had to get into a discussion with the leadership and you know that product vendors leadership to say that you know these are the people who can probably spend some time and do things you know do the configuration rather than only saying that what you are doing is not good and we had to literally revisit the contracting terms i mean not we but uh, the customer had to revisit the uh, terms but i i personally feel like and this will come up when we define the working model right in, let's say the whole team is coming together the testers developers or you know whoever are the advisors they are coming together they would say that my contract doesn't allow me to do this then what do we do if it is really critical and if it is becoming a risk to the success of the program we probably have to go back and revisit the contract and take leadership and leadership support will be extremely critical in this because depending upon the budget that they have and uh, the way the contracts have happened thank yeah. you yeah sure okay thank you very much thank you for attending this session